Hey, welcome back. Today we'll be going over the histology of the kidneys. So the function depends on the blood supply um, because the urinary system is responsible for the regulation of uh, the blood volume, erythropoiesis, and excretion of toxins. Kidneys are your best friend because they correct any kind of imbalance in the body. Um, the urinary system is composed of the kidneys, the ureters, the urinary bladder, and the urethra. Uh, whenever I mention bladder, I really do mean the urinary bladder. Okay, so it's covered by thin fibrous connective tissue, a uh, capsule, and it's surrounded by quite a bit of fat. So the perirenal fat is, of course, around the, um, the kidney, but there is some adipose tissue uh, like between the, the, the capsule and the kidney itself as well. And the perirenal fat will lie between the renal fascia um, and the capsule. Uh, I'm just repeating myself, sorry about that, but that's where it lies. Um, vessels will enter the sinus, which is like this area in the hilum of the kidney. And then the renal vein and the lymphatics will, and the renal pelvis will leave um, in like a lower area, like right around here. Um, the artery br will branch in the renal sinus to supply the, the pyramids and the calluses, and they are all lined by a renal fibrous capsule that is continuous with the adventitia of the minor renal callus, calluses or calluses. So there's smooth muscle um, in the kidney, and uh, there's the transitional epithelium and the minor calyx um, and the collection ducts that will drain into the minor calyx. So the outermost structure is the cortex, so is the outer structure, and then the inner is the um, renal medulla. The cortex and the medulla are made out of nephrons along with the blood, lymphatics, and nerves. So the collecting tubular system is made out of the, of the collecting ducts and tubules, and the nephron is made out of the renal corpuscle, um, which is um, actually like a, a vasculature, and tubules. The renal sinus is the cavity, and that contains um, like a lot of the kidney, the renal pelvis, the calluses, the vessels, and some of the fat. So the renal corpuscle is inside the Bowman's capsule, and in within that, there's a bunch of like uh, renal tubules, which are the proximal convoluted, the proximal straight, um, part of the loop of Henle, the distal straight tubule, the distal convoluted tubule, and the connecting tubule. Um, as you can see here, proximal tubule. Uh, all of this is the Bowman's capsule. And um, there is a basement membrane, and uh, within it is the Bowman space, where there's the exchange of uh, water and gas, or water and, um, and uh, material. Um, not necessarily toxins really, but it could be like, you know, proteins and um, whatever. We'll, we'll go more through it when we go through the actual system. Anyway, um, the connecting tubule uh, connects the last part of the nephron to the, the collecting tubule. And in the cortex, they merge to form the cortical collecting tubules in these long structures called the cortical medullary rays. And the cortical collecting tubules are the juxtamedullary um, nephrons, they will arch up and merge to make the cortical connecting ducts, or collecting ducts, pardon me. So the small cortical collecting tubules will merge and they form a large cortical collecting tubule and uh, a cortical collecting duct, so tubules to ducts. Um, ducts will get larger and then they enter the renal medulla and become the medullary uh, collecting ducts, and all of those will merge and make the papillary ducts of Bellini. And those will open into the apex of the renal pyramid in the cribriform area and deliver the urine into the uh, minor renal calluses. So it goes into the, um, into the, the, the urine. So the urine kind of comes from the cortex into the medulla, out again to the cortex and then finally in, into the medulla within the uh, the collecting ducts. So the cortex is going to be um, smooth on the outer zone and those will make the cortical pyramids or cortical columns that 
project in between the pyramids and those will contain the uh, renal corpuscles and proximal convoluted tubules that have a part that enter the renal medulla, uh, as you can see here. So uh, there's the proximal convoluted tubule and then the descending limb and then that goes into the uh, uh, the renal medulla along with the ascending limb. The distal convoluted tubules uh, go back into the cortex and then the cortical collecting tubules are surrounded by a bunch of uh, vessels. Let's follow the track again. So there is the proximal convoluted tubule goes down into the cortex or medulla th through the thick descending limb and then there's it changes into the thin descending limb and then go back into the thin ascending limb into the thick ascending limb and then into the glomerulus area where there's going to be some um, blood exchange and then through the distal convoluted tubules through the collecting tubules into the collecting ducts into the papillary duct and then um, into the uh, like the, the calyx so the medulla has uh, about 15 pyramids and the apex of two to three pyramids make one papilla and all of those are capped by a cortical tissue to make the lobe so here's the inner medulla and then the cortex and those will contain the loop of Henle the collecting, uh, the connecting and collecting tubules and ducts, along with all these blood vessels. The medullary rays are going to be the straight tube tubules coming in uh, into the, like the cortex. Um, there are going to be um, alternations with the regions of convoluted tubules and the renal corpuscles in the cortex. So that's how what makes it like a pyramid and then like the, the column and then pyramid in the column. The renal lobules are going to be straight tubules of nephrons around a medullary rays that drain into a common collecting duct. So um, here's the collecting duct and it's kind of like, it looks like it's just one um, like little nephrons, but uh, there's actually a bunch of nephrons that like drain into a, a common collecting duct. Uh, the kidneys are going to be supplied by the renal arteries and those will split into the lobar arteries and then from there it splits into the interlobar arteries and the inner lobar arteries will run between the pyramids and then like split into the arcuate arteries and those like arc over the pyramids and run in the cortex and those end and so those are blind ended um, arteries the interlobular arteries will divide into the afferent glomerular arterioles and some branches will perforate um, the radiate arteries and then those will supply the renal capsule. The afferent arteries will make the glomerulus and blood leaves through the efferent arterioles. So as you can see here, it's um, here's the arteries the, the radiate arteries from the uh, arcuate arteries will supply the glomerulus. So this is a nice little chart showing how it comes in from the renal artery and leaves to the renal vein. The mesangium um, contains afferent and efferent glomerular arterioles and those will pass through the glomerular capsule. The mesangium itself is a vascular pole of renal corpuscle and it's made out of the mesangial cells and the mesangial matrix. Mesangial matrix is made out of like, um, like ground substance, collagen, um, fibers, uh, reticular fibers and whatnot. The efferent arterioles will break up in the peritubular capsule and um, or the peritubular capillary plexus and those will network um, by surrounding and supplying the urinephorous tubules. So here's the mesangial matrix around here. Um, here's the glomerular capillary. Right here would be the Bowman's capsule and this is the, uh, not as important, but there's a glycocalyx uh, coat kind of like surrounding the capillary and uh, more importantly there's that basement membrane. It's pretty tightly adherent. adherent. So here's the mesangial cells. They're uh, they have a very dark nuclei, um, very condensed chromatin, and there are red blood cells uh, nearby. 
here's the filtration membrane. Bowman's space is where uh, the kidney is being drained into. Podocytes kind of like keep the uh, the 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 filtration membrane in place and maintained and then there the capillary endothelium to deliver uh, like blood so the efferent arterioles from the juxta juxta medullary nephron will branch into the descending vasa recta which make this like you know plexus the thin descending vasa recta branch into the peritubular capillary network in the medulla and then they return as one by as in the um, ascending vasorector, and the cortex it gets a lot more blood than the medulla. The afferent arterioles, like the ones coming in, are larger than efferent arterioles, and as a result of that, the efferent arterioles have higher resistance, and those um, provide the pressure in the glomerular capillary bed. Why is that important? Um, because with the higher resistance, um, uh, there is more blood flow to the, the uh, kidneys there's more demand for that blood and also it, it prevents the backflow of going um into the into the 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 capillaries again because there's the constant need to like push it through uh, and usually that works for a healthy person uh, problematic when you're diabetic so in the cortex the stellate veins will collect blood from the most superficial zone of the renal cortex along with the fibrous renal capsule and those will all drain into the interlobal veins those will be joined by the peritubular capillary plexus along with ascending vas recta and then like you know loop up and then drain into the arcuate veins the arcuate veins will drain into the interlobar and then from there the renal veins and then finally into the internal um, vena cava so there's no segmental artery organization. It doesn't branch out like the arteries. It's pretty straightforward. The glomerulus um, is the vascular. Oh, there's two like parts of it. There's a vascular pole, which is um, very like well supplied with blood. And then the tubular urinary pole, which is uh, where the role takes place, right? The Bowman's capsule surrounds it is a double layer of epithelium. And the inner parietal layer is going to be simple squamous, and it's continuous with the proximal convoluted tubule at the urinary pole. The visceral layer um, has the little podocytes, and of course, I, like I just said, is there to support and maintain. Um, and then surrounding all of this is the capsular space. The podocytes lie on the basal uh, lamina. They interdigit or like touch feet with um, neighboring podocytes to make something called a slit pore. And those are special tight junctions. And those also are made out of nephrins, glycoproteins, and proteoglycans to block protein passage. So whenever you see protein in the blood or proteinuria, you know for sure that's a bad sign because these um, like little guys are make quite a robust. Uh, barrier that's why um, even in a lot of conditions you don't have uh, blood in the urine and you don't have protein in the urine it's only when the kidneys are breaking down that's when you have the, um, those substances in the urine so it makes the filtration membrane barrier which is a fenestrated capillary endothelium along with the glomerular basement membrane and the slit diaphragm so it's like three layers Fluid under pressure will move from the capillary across the filtration barrier to enter the capsular space or the Bowman space. And then the basal, uh, the basal lamina of the glomerular basement membrane is made out of um, quite a few like, you know, um, like solid proteins, like solid as in um, these are very robust. So type 4 collagen, um, a laminin and heparin sulfate proteoglycans, and those function as a size and charge barrier so um, if it's too acidic or too um, uh, basic it's not going to be allowed in unless uh, allowed which is what the slit di diaphragm is for um, the mesangial cells of the renal corpuscle has some contractile properties and they the, the thought is they they kind of like help squeeze the, the fluid through because of the contraction. The interglomerular mesangial cells will lie between the endothelial cells of the capillary and then they cover the, the remaining uh, surface that's you know not occupied by the podocytes so it's not like podocytes, blank space, podocyte. There are these cells that lie between. 
the macula densa or lasis cell um, are also like extra glomerular cells, so they lie outside the glomerulus. And those are adjacent to the afferent and efferent arterioles. And those support the glomerular capillaries and they help uh, unclog and modulate flow through the glomerular basement membrane. And these uh, respond to angiotensin. So uh, if angiotensin is necessary, they will be created, converted in the lungs to angiotensin 2, uh, travel down to the kidneys, uh, bind to the receptors, and these will constrict in order to raise blood pressure. Okay, so glomerular disease, there are several different types. Acute nephritic syndrome, so it's ne acute nephritic, so uh, inflammation of the um, uh kind of like the entire kidney itself really but in more in particular the renal um, glomerulus and the tubules and it can be caused by a infection or an autoimmune disease acute glomerulonephritis is going to be a, a swelling proliferation of glomerular tissue that damage the other tissues um, surrounding it. So it damages the capillaries, the mesangium, and the basement membrane. And that can be caused by uh, uh, this uh, bacterial infection, uh, streptococcus. And it can also be a result of a skin infection and pharyngitis. Um, these uh, these uh, bacteria and viruses can actually migrate in and affect the kidneys. And then uh, this can be also caused by um, IgA nephropathy, which is autoimmune, um, and lupus, and like Vergener's Virgin gran granulomatosis, which is some kind of cancer. So in a normal kidneys, the glomerulus keeps the blood, uh, the cells in the blood and only like fluid out. Like I said, once it starts breaking down, um, red blood cells are released, making the urine very dark. It's almost like brown. Mm. A hypercoagulation and thrombosis uh, will cause the cytokines and whatnot to be released, causing constriction, causing necrosis and ischemia, and then um, the glomerulus will break down. Okay, so acute glomerulonephritis is going to be uh, really like characterized by sudden onset of hematuria, so blood in the urine, and proteinuria, along with hypertension, edema, azotemia and salt and uh, uh, water retention, so uh, problems with uh, different kinds of salts. Um, pH will change. There's going to be some structural change, proliferation of the capillary glomerular endothelial cells in order to try to like you know compensate, but that leads to the swelling of the endothelium and it narrows the capillaries and there's a proliferation of neutrophils. So normally you don't see so much, but with the constricted um, capillaries and the like uh, increased amount of neutrophils and um, the neutrophils are going to be in all sorts of phases so they may not be very mature they might be mature and that's called a pleomorphic population um, there's going to be a, lots of like granular uh, like uh, material around the, the the cells and there's going to be a lot of uh, deposits of uh, cytokines and immunoglobulins. So there's going to be an elevated uh, BUN, so uh, it's a it's a nitric uh, uh, protein, um, and that's because the abnormal basement membrane allows a, the albumin protein to leak out. Diabetic nephropathy, uh, nephropathy is um, when the mesangial cells expand due to the hyperglycemia and with like the extra amount of sugar and like, you know, just um, resource, the cells make a lot more matrix or they increase the glycation of the matrix proteins and that causes the thickening of the basement membrane like quite a bit, like almost three to five times. And the lamina is lost, as you can see here, um, and it leaks because now it's um, is not like nicely differentiated. And there is arteriolar hyalinosis, so the arterioles are going to be replaced with like hyalin. Um, glomerular sclerosis is when the intraglomerular hypertension is 
occurring because of the dilated afferent renal artery or some kind of ischemic injury. This one is good because it's reversible. <laughs> um, the nephropathy, not so much. If you catch it really early, then maybe the body can compensate for it. But usually when it, it becomes like, you know, when, when you're um, urinating uh, glucose, that, that's when it's practically non-reversible because the kidneys have entered like end stage uh, disease. Uh, camel style Wilson nodules are large circular acellular accumulate, uh, accumulations. Look, there's no cells in it. It's just a chunk of, um, hyalinization. Um, like I said, sclerosis and hyalinization is, uh, irreversible. And end stage renal disease is when the glomerular tuft is just, like, completely really, um, completely replaced with hyaline so of course the glomerulus is not going to act be active anymore so there's going to be like the thickened um almost undifferentiable basement membrane uh the arteriolar hyalinosis like you can't even tell like what's an opening anymore okay so there's a bunch of mesangial abnormalities Here's a normal one with a thin capillary wall, or there's a normal glomerulus. This is when this starts being problematic, when the, the walls are getting to be thick and it's starting to expand. And then with um, immunofluorescence, you can see there's going to be like Ig um, and cytokines deposits. So type 1 is the membranoproliferative um, glomerulonephritis. And there's going to be hypercellular glomeruli with the increased number of mesangial cells. And um, they're going to be lobular, have huge matrix. And that's problematic because it like expands and compresses the kidneys. Or, I'm sorry, compre compresses the capillaries. The leukocytes will come in and um, they deposit immune complexes and, and whatever. And that activates um, the complementary path of... Uh, of um, clotting and uh, that leads to more constriction so the glomerular capillary will have a double contour and a bunch of like inclusions and um, unfortunately uh, it's unremitting so it, it doesn't get any better uh, renal failure will occur within 10 years without treatment there's basement membrane diseases that um, kind of uh, affect mostly like the structural and functional abnormalities and that leads to, of course, leakage of things in the urine, edema, and um, you, this one also, like, you would leak out um, uh, lipids as well. So, membranous nephropathy, nephropathy is the dep deposition of antigen antibodies, and this is um, autoimmune, so these antigen antibodies will um, attack the basement membrane. Alport uh, syndrome, uh, we've covered this before many times, and this will lead to sclerotic and thick uh, glomerular basement membrane, and it's also associated with the deafness and retinopathy because there's some um, type 4 collagen affected. Um, it usually is in children and, you know, young adults, and there's something called persistent microhematuria. Um, you won't see the blood in the urine unless it is, like, uh, unless it's, uh, you know, tested. Um, even when you collect the, the urine, it may look a little bit dark, but you don't actually see the red blood cells because there's not a lot. So it's microhematuria. Um, hearing loss, unfortunately, is not fixed with the kidney transplant because that's more of a developmental, uh, like, abnormality, like, to begin with. Um, transplantation is the only cure. Here is a normal GMB abnormal so look how thin it is and then in outport like you can hardly tell like where is it you know and all the splits in it as well sclerosing is going to be the scarring of the glomerulus and of course that doesn't work because now it's replaced with scar tissue necrotizing is going to be cell death inside the glomerulus crescentic is the accumulation of um, all the cells that shouldn't be in there in the bowman space and nephritic syndrome is going to be an inflammatory response to the glomeruli, while nephrotic syndrome is damage to our podocytes. So um, the basement membrane isn't going to be able to be managed well.
So in, in nephritic syndrome, there's the inflammation of the glomeruli, and you are going to have the hematuria and oliguria. So uh, with this condition, you, you, the patient is going to have to pee many, many times. It's also known as Berger's disease, and it's the most common cause of primary glomerulonephritis, nephrotic syndrome. Um, you get hypoalbuminemia, so you don't have a lot of albumin, and that leads to peripheral edema because albumin is a kidney, and it sucks the fluid back in due to like oncotic pressure. And there is going to be hyperlipidemia because there's no um, oncotic pressure. There's no protein to uh, balance out the, the difference of uh, pressure. So there's going to be more um, lipids in place to kind of maintain the um, osmotic or oncotic balance. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't work because you still have like massive uh, proteinuria, which leads to more um, lipids accumulating in the blood, which leads to like atherosclerosis. Niels disease is a minimal change disease, and it's the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in kids. Uh, it's idiopathic, uh, but in adults, it's secondary to the use of NSAIDs and um, Hodgkin's lymphoma. And uh, it really can be only seen by uh, electron transport, uh, transport, <laughs> electron um, uh, transmitting uh, microscope, sorry. Um, and there is leakage of albumin, because of a polyanionic charge due to cytokines released by the T cells. So the T cells release too many cytokines. Um, it's characterized by these like onset edema, proteinuria, um, all this than the other, but normal renal function, which is strange. Uh, what's more important is not to, not to identify this as Nils disease, um, especially if it's in children. Um, it's really important to identify the underlying disease. So if it's, um, you know, overuse of NSAIDs or Hodgkin's lymphoma, that's the one you want to tackle. Okay, so that's it for now. Thank you for your attention and good luck studying.